We found the boys. They're alive. Based on the incredible true story. How do you think we're going to get those kids out? From Academy Award winner Ron Howard. We could use a couple more divers. A tale of hope and the power of the human spirit. The whole thing is insane. We're desperate. One of Ron Howard's best films. Their only chance. 13 Lives for your consideration. Hi, so my name is John August. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to be talking to you today, Bill about uh, 13 Lives, but also I'd love to talk about sort of screenwriting in general and your career sure. and many other things. Where are we talking to you today from? I see it's I, I'm there. in uh, the south of England in Sussex in the converted garage where I do all my work um, in the lovely English countryside. Fantastic. Um, let's start with 13 Lives because th I just watched it last night. I'm really curious how you came into the project because uh, I remember the story as it was first being, you know, happening in real time. And it was, felt like, okay, well, obviously, there's gonna be a movie coming out of this. But what was your entrance into this as a movie? Well, like you, I, I remember it from when it actually happened. And I, I kind of I wouldn't say I followed every beat, but obviously, I did follow it. And, mm -hmm. and it was very moving. Um, and then I forgot about it. And yeah. um, sometime later, as is the way of these things, um, a producer got in touch with me and said, would I be interested in writing the screenplay? And um, I was initially a little reluctant because I thought maybe it was an over simple story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, guys go down a cave, get stuck, it's all terrible, then they get out and it's okay. But of course, they sent me some research, they'd had a lot of research done on it. And uh, that kind of amazed me. And I realized what a rich tale it was and uh, and it kind of it moved me in a whole different way actually and and I really like writing very um emotionally valid and powerful pieces so I I said yes but the simple answer is I got asked right well that's great to be asked well uh, I'm not surprised you're asked because if you look at sort of your credits and look at the, the movies you've written going back to you know Gladiator and, and you know Shadowlands and, and those uh, things but more recently Everest, um, Unbroken, other true stories and finding sort of the ways to tell these historical true stories in ways that are compelling, you seem like a very great fit for it. I guess my question is, when they came to approach you to write this, how much did they have? Often on the Script Notes podcast, we get these questions about like, oh, like, what rights do I need to do to tell a, a true story? And, I, and people will jock, we'll see producers jockeying for rights, to like, you know, locking up this person's life rights or this person's life rights. As they came to you, what were they coming to you with? They had you said there was some original research, but what else? Yeah, you're 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 completely right. It was a rights nightmare, <clears throat> and uh, lots of other projects were in the in the mix. Um, there was another team that had the rights to the Australian doctor, um, Harry Harris. Mm -hmm. We did not have the rights to the Thai kids at all. The um, Thai government controlled that. Um, so the the key rights were to the British divers. Yes. And those were the ones that my producer had obtained. And um, that was the, 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 the core of, of the, the project. The rest we had to, you, you know, the, the process, we had mm -hmm. to use material that was in the public domain. Um, and it's, it's worrying, you know, when you're doing something like that. It's worrying on all sorts of levels. It's worrying also because I'm dealing with real people's real lives yes. who are still there, yeah. especially the Thai people. So um, I think... We had a superb level of research, which fed me absolutely as much as possible. And I just did my best to, to give a fair crack to, to all of those individuals. Now, you say you have research, and how much of that was coming to you in written form versus your ability to talk to these divers? What was your ability to um, you know, reach out and ask specific questions, or did you have to go through levels to get there? What was your connection to... Uh, these with, characters with the the two main divers it was uh i i went and visited them and talked to them and mm -hmm. and subsequently was uh, made very good relations with them and was able to check a lot of things with them as i went along all the rest was um at one remove this was in covid times yeah and uh um it was uh, the superb um researcher had had amassed an enormous amount of material mostly remotely you know um, particularly on all the all the Thai details, 
And I was supplied with that when I began because the producer had also produced the documentary, which is called The Rescue. So they'd done all the research for that. So I was given all of that. Um, and, uh, and I was able to um, ask the researcher to follow up whenever I, I wanted. So I was very well supported. Now, one of the fundamental you know, decisions you have to make as a writer is sort of, you know, how you're going to tell the story and yeah. sort of when you're going to start the story yeah. and what, re- yeah. what details are going to reveal at what point. How early in the process of, of the conversations with the producers about coming on to do this, did you have an approach? Did you have a take for how you're going to tell the story? Not immediately, but um, you're completely right. I mean, people think if you have a true story, I mean, basically, you kind of take down what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, you sort of do because you have an obligation to, to the truth. But my job is finding the emotional through line and also the mini emotional stories within the overall one because nobody is going to watch just to hear a lot of facts they watch yeah. because of what you make them feel about the characters what the characters want what the characters fear and what then happens to them so it really is a kind of um, crafting of real events to create emotional drama um, I mean of course there is emotional drama once you've got kids threatening with death but you've really got to do a lot more than that so I looked at the material and I looked at, I drew up a kind of timeline of my own that with the the peaks and the troughs. And I looked at that very early on. And because obviously the producers, when they ask me to do it, they don't just say, go ahead and do it. They say, tell us what you will do before any contract gets signed. And that's fair enough. So I give them, I suppose, my pitch really. And um, I said very early on, the obvious thing which anybody tackling this story would say, which is, we cannot afford to make this be a white savior story. So how are we going to deal with that? We're going to look at all of the Thai stories and we're going to look at what they did and the complexities of that and how much we can weave that in. I made a decision very early on that this was in a way not the story of the boys. Mm -hmm. And this was partly because I did not have their rights, but it was also partly because they're stuck they're in a cave and you have a choice. Are you going to keep cutting back to them inside the cave, getting hungrier and hungrier or not? And I said, my way of doing this is we're going to see them go in and then we're not going to see them again until they're found. And yeah, after so it's, that, it's 45 yeah. minutes into the film before we see them again. We, we see yeah. like, oh, they are actually alive. And there's a real open question. Yeah. Obviously, as an audience who has some knowledge coming into it, we know that they're alive yeah. in there, but the, but yeah. everyone on the outside doesn't. And there's, you set up a good expectation that maybe they are going to find bodies ultimately that you don't know well, where they it, are, how far. It's very interesting the, the way you can tell a story where people know the ending and still make it tense. And I, I think it's because as people watch, they accept that they're within that, that moment. I mean, one of the reasons that I took the project on actually was because one of the things that really struck me After the divers found the boys, there was this ecstasy throughout this enormous camp, this real cheers, you know, the boys are there, the boys are alive. And that was simultaneously experienced with the divers knowing that the boys are going to die, that there is no way they can come out. And I I find that sort of crunch very powerful. And when I saw that, I thought, actually, we have got a story here. Um, And of course, once if you can communicate to the viewers sufficiently, this really is an insoluble problem. And then you proceed to find a crazy solution, which against all the odds works. Um, and you you have a story. Yeah. Now let's talk about decisions of, you know, classic characters and themes going through stuff. You, you have you've, we've, you've actors we recognize who are doing um, certain things, but you also, what I was really impressed by with the movie and you talk about sort of like making sure that the Thai people and their efforts are, centered in this um for a lot of the, of the start of the film and, and really throughout the film we're seeing um the rescue efforts from the thai perspective and these are competent people who are doing their very best and it mm. feels like it feels very documentary in a, in a good way it feels very sort of matter of fact you don't see a lot of speechifying you don't see people stopping to um to to explain something about like you know thai culture and history and stuff it's, it's very much focused on the moment did you know from the start that um, you're going to have so many characters and that we as an audience might not even really know their names. I'm thinking about like the, the engineer on top of the mountain who's like trying to divert the water. Uh, we, we recognize him, but we don't know anything 
we know very little about him. Did you know that from the start that you'd have this wide array of characters? Well, yes, in the sense that I had to place my um, heroic British divers in this much bigger context. Mm -hmm. I think the first thing that I thought when I looked into all this um, story was what an enormous number of people volunteered. Yeah, There was this great mass, like 5,000 people, just gave their time or their equipment for nothing. And I loved that. It runs counter to the kind of story that we're being told all the time, which is that we live in a competitive world where people only get off their bottoms for money. And uh, I, I, I wanted to celebrate that very much, which meant locating as many of these stories as possible. But then you have to make them. I mean, there are very many stories. You simply don't have the space. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, you kind of color code the characters so that mm -hmm. people recognize them visually rather than knowing their names. Um, you also give them each a little kind of um, trick so that you you can spot how they're likely to, 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 to act. And you can only do that to a very small degree because you're juggling so many characters. Um, and I think that I, I really felt these, you, you talk about it being documentary. Yes, it's documentary in the sense that it did happen and we're not grandstanding with it. We're not trying to make out this is some sort of uh, opportunity for people to make grand speeches. But I actually think the grand sentiments come over much more powerfully if you throw them away. Mm -hmm. If they're kind of not asserted, you ask the audience to find that for themselves. And that's a conscious decision, particularly with the main divers who, who really led me into this by their own characters. I was picking up from what they told me about themselves, which is, we don't do this for money, we're amateurs, we're not interested in publicity. Um, but they've got a kind of rather delightful, I mean, there was something that got cut out, but when they were first asked to come, uh, um, Rick, the, 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 the um, Viggo Mortensen one, said, uh, how are we getting there? And uh, John says, Tim, well, they're giving us um, business class flights. He always, oh, business class, I'll fly anywhere. And I, I love that. It's, yeah. it's very British, very um, un undercutting heroism and, and grandiosity. So I was working from their characters, I also think it means that you can feed your actors with a role where they have very few words, but a lot of emotional moments. And those emotional moments, they are gonna act them. They're gonna be on their face. And if you've correctly structured the emotional trajectory, the audience knows what they're thinking and feeling, looking at their face. They don't need words. And that is what screenwriters do. And it drives me nuts when people say, somebody said to me, oh, you didn't have much to do for the first oh, 20 yeah. minutes, did you? You know, <laughs> I, said, I wrote the damn thing. Every beat is written. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, you know, it's not that there's, like, what is the camera pointing at? What are you, what are you seeing? What are we learning? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about- uh, the not, not just that, by the way. Not just that. I mean, um, Ron and I talked a lot about structuring the dives because mm -hmm. too many dives are boring. Each dive has to have its own character, its own emotional little little story. And I mean, I literally listed them all with the emotions that accompanied them. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the emotional trajectory of the Viggo Mortensen character, um, because he's the one who I think, um, I would say your characters don't protagonate a lot. They're, they're not going through like this classic giant characters arc where they come in as one thing and, and leave fully transformed. It's small and it's subtle, but it's there. And so Viggo Mortensen yeah. is probably, the character is probably the easiest one to see that. He's initially reluctant to necessarily go on this dive, to, to even join on this trip. And then when he's there, he's skeptical a, a lot along the way. What were the beats you sort of mapped out for yourself? And were they literally in an outline form? Like how much were you thinking about sort of how his character progressed over the course of the story and how did you chart that for yourself well it, that's kind of fairly simple really because you know he starts out not wanting to go mm -hmm. doesn't like kids as he says yeah. um he gets there there he's pissed off because um you then have all the beats about the local thai um uh, divers don't rate mm -hmm. them which is fun to, to have that they're old guys you know yeah. so you play that which gives him something to resent. Um, eventually they do get allowed to dive and it goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, they pull out the, um, the, the pumping guy and it all goes wrong. And then they're stuck and he wants to go home. So I've got that, that beat. Yeah. And all the time you've got John beside him acting as the 
the uh, antagonist, his protagonist, in a way, yep. saying, yeah, but we've got to stay. John, who knows, and I like this, John knows that Rick really wants to save the boys, even though Rick says he doesn't. Mm -hmm. And that helps me a lot, and I can write those, those little, little moments. Um, and, of course, the, 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 the big beat with, with Rick uh, is that they find the, the kids and he's depressed. He yeah. goes down instead of up. Um, yeah. And uh, then you've got the interesting question of and this. I had to argue out with both John and Rick. Who had the idea to um, use anesthetics? Mm -hmm. And I got it wrong the first time around and, uh, because it worked in my structure to have, mm -hmm. have John suggest it. And, uh, but Rick, the real Rick, said to me, that's because we show them the script. Yeah. You know, this yeah. is no secret to them, of course. I mean, I always do that, by the way. When I'm dealing with real live people, I will see you can see anything I'm writing at any time. Of course, it's their life. And Rick said, and, and I said to them originally, you're going to find this really peculiar because I'm going to invent two characters it's called Rick and John. I have to. Hmm. And they were really good about that. They got it. Yeah. I mean, lots of stuff I just made up. And they yeah. said, that's fine. But he did say, that was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I re restructured that beat um, then you bring in the next uh, group of divers and in the cut version they come very abruptly I, I wrote several scenes that introduced them but you know it's a long movie yeah something has to go um, and you have the relationship with the incoming divers which again reflects on on Rick because Jason is the one who thinks Rick's you know a little bit past it and um, so you then realize Rick is the leader he has gone along with this idea. The failure will be his failure. So we're now emotionally engaged on his behalf, not just the boys. Um, and that then takes you through the various beats of, of you know, finding um, semi-failure along the way and until the moment when they're sitting in a group and they're just laughing. Yeah. And you can feel the release of the nervous tension. And you don't, and the, the, the moments when he's resisted contact with the families. I mean, I had so many moments I could track and there he is hugging the families or being hugged, I should mm. say, because yeah. he kind of doesn't know how to do it. Um, so it's a gift really to, 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 to track all those points. I did give him a, a little speech, um, which is not in the film, right at the end when they're in their minibus and they're going back to the airport. And he's saying, you know what? This is something that should not have worked. The, this is like a one in a thousand chance that it worked, but it did work. And you know what? The fuckers will make a movie out of it and everybody okay. will think it's easy. And I rather liked that, but no, it didn't, didn't come to pass. Yeah, I, the movie probably wanted to be over before they would have had a chance for that moment. But uh, let's talk about sort of the dialogue that's in the movie and the dialogue that's not in the movie because they both help inform. So let's talk about the dialogue that's not in the movie because it's... Um, there's not a lot of talking. These, you know, we have our characters mostly doing the work that they're there to do. And there's this misconception, obviously, that uh, the screenwriter just writes the dialogue and the director does everything else. But it sounds like, you know, if I'm reading the script, um, I get a very good sense of what those characters are, what's going through those characters' heads, even as they are silently observing, moving their way through the cave, stopping to get a breath. Um, I'm thinking back to the Colin Farrell's character and sort of kind of half freaking out because the, the kids, um, his kid is, is, is way, has woken up. There's all those moments. Those are all scripted. I think it's crucial that we remind people that those moments are in the script from the start. That's right. Yeah, you're right. I mean, my if you were to see one of the sort of drafts towards the end, mm -hmm. you'd get a lot more dialogue. Uh, well, it's not so much more dialogue because there are several scenes that were basically dialogue scenes. Yeah. And this always happens to me. I guess I overwrite. Yeah. I'm always writing dialogue scenes, which I think really help to get us sympathetic with the characters. Yeah. And they're too long. And in the end, the whole thing goes. Yeah. But the people along the way read them. Yes. And uh, your point is correct. That feeds in. To their understanding and the director reads them mm -hmm. and i have no complaints about what is cut out in fact throughout my career i've had the kind of embarrassing experience of writing scenes that seem to me to be vital having them cut out and realizing they weren't necessary 
And I think each time I think, when am I going to learn? When am I going to write the 90 page script that they shoot instead of the 120 page script? And um, I don't know why I don't learn, but that's the process. And uh, uh, I mean, I've worked with some actors. I remember a million years ago, I wrote a film called First Night mm -hmm. with um, Sean Connery and Richard Gere. And Sean Connery um, sat me down in his hotel room in London with a scene. And he said, look, I, I want to go through this scene with you. I'll do my lines, you do the other person's lines, you see. Yeah. So I, I did the other person's lines and I would do the line and Sean went, ah. And then I did the next line here. Mm. And I did the next line. Mm. <laughs> and he never spoke a word. And it all made perfectly good sense. So he said, would you mind if we just... You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought hell spells. You know. but, but maybe you have to start with more and, and, and hone it down. And you are dependent on the actors because once you start dispensing with the words, you've, you've structured it so that the audience knows what the actor is likely to be feeling but the actor has got to deliver that yeah. without overacting and I, in my opinion acting has become so sophisticated now actors are so extraordinary film actors you can sort of see what they're thinking um you know i i, I can think of um, moments like the little scene where harry harris is um being asked to use his skills as an anesthetist, and he's saying no, and the other two, Rick and John, are disagreeing on how to deal with him. And there aren't many words, but that little trio, you can see what each one is thinking mm -hmm. right the way through, and there's a couple of shots at the end that are just faces saying nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's also very skilled directing, of course. It is. There's a moment in Worst Person in the World, a film from last year, where a woman makes a fundamental like life decision, and we see it completely on her face. And and yes, it was the screenwriting that got us from like her leaving a party to standing at that place and, and being able to think, but like the natural instinct would be for her to say something to someone to sort of make sure we understood that. And yet yeah. um, the power of a camera and a, and a really talented face, we can see all that information. It's, it's yeah. a great yeah. lesson to learn. Yeah. But let's go, let's go back to like, you know, you say you overwrite and you need to like learn how to write the 90 page version of a thing. Also, it's just recognizing that the process of making um, stories is that there's, there's always going to be too much and there's going to be some there's going to be a process of discovery there so giving yourself permission to yes. overwrite there a bit and recognizing and hopefully having good collaborators who will see yes there may be too much here but we need this we need the, all this too muchness in order to find the movie that we're also going to want to make yeah i, I would definitely agree with that yeah well, let's talk about sort of your relationship with Ron Howard and sort of at what point did he come into the process? Was he there from the start or only after you had a draft? What was his involvement in the film? Uh, he was not there from the start. Uh, it was pretty much completely written. But what, what happened was the, the producer, um, PJ, um, hired me. And at that point, he had a, a, an arrangement with another director, a very good director. And I worked on it with that director. And I did, I guess, three drafts. Okay. Um, and we kind of ran into a problem um, of how we saw the movie yeah. between me and the director. And uh, I realized, and I, you know, I, I have huge respect for the directors that I work with, and I tried very hard to to deliver the kind of tone that he was looking for. But it ran counter to my instincts, and I argued it very strongly with him. But he was very clear what he wanted. And so there came a point when I said to PJ, I'm going to have to leave the project. Um, I, I, you must get another writer who's in sync with your director. And they had a big think about it, and the director had a big think about it. And to his enormous credit, I mean, he said, look, because PJ and Gabby Turner, the other producer, kind of liked my take. Mm -hmm. So he said, OK, look, I'll withdraw. It's not a problem. So he withdrew. I then proceeded with my version, which was, uh, to put it very, very simply, more emotional, mm -hmm. okay? He was much more action and repression, which is a great way to go. And I was, I mean, I'm a very warm-hearted person. Um, and uh, so we proceeded with my version and, and I did several drafts until both the producers were thinking, this is good, we will shop it. Mm -hmm. They then took it to their agents in LA. And that is when it went to Imagine. And that's when Ron picked it up. 
So Ron then came in and I then worked with Ron for several more drafts. And uh, well, I, I, we both had the experience of like, you know, an existing draft and a director comes on board and it's both a, a, a conversation with the director about sort of what movie they see versus the movie that you wrote and what they need. And um, you're trying to explain what your intentions were with things and they are trying to explain what they think they actually need from a movie. Um, what guidance can you give to a, a writer listening to like those conversations with the director? How do you approach that in a way that both sides benefit? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the first thing is you have to not be defensive. Yeah. And uh, as a writer, I mean, writers, we writers have a very tough time because we are not in control. Yeah. That is the reality. If you want to be in control, be a writer director, mm. which I have also done. Um, you are not in control. The director is going to have to make this damn movie. Yeah. So it's no good you demanding that the director executes your vision. He's going to execute his or her vision. So don't be defensive. So what you do is when the director says, I think we need more of this or less of this, what you've got to think is, why is he saying that? Mm -hmm. What's happening here? Is there a, a valid point here? And if there is, how can I enact it in a way that fits my vision. Yeah. And my experience has been particularly, I mean, I've, I've had some bad ones, but mostly they've been good. My experience has been that it improves when you do this. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, if you get, and this applies to development as well, if you get notes, don't obey the note. If the note says, um, we think, you know, the dog should jump over the cliff. Don't say, okay, I will write in the dog. dog. Say to yourself, why did they say that? Mm -hmm. And haven't I got a better way of giving them what they want? Yeah. Because you will have, because you'll understand the whole thing. And they're probably looking just at that beat. And that's the problem you have with some directors. Some directors aren't good at overall structure. And I'm talking now about really emotional storytelling. Mm -hmm. They're good at a scene. They know yeah. that they can make a scene work. They can make that scene work when the guy comes in and we don't even know what he's seeing and he's incredibly scared. So, but they don't realize how that impacts down the, down the road. So what you have to do is say, okay, they want an emotional high point, which I have not delivered. I better find a way to deliver it and then they'll be happy at that mm -hmm. point. Yeah. If you have a problem, I have had this with some extremely famous directors who've said, um, you know, I think there should be a scene like this here. And I've said to the team, that will make no sense. That will wreck the whole flow. And they've said, the boss has asked for it. You've got to do it. Mm -hmm. So I then do it. And in my experience, always those are the projects that don't get made. Yeah. Because the director hasn't understood what the story is, but the director is too powerful. And there are too many directors, unfortunately, who never get anybody telling them boo. Yeah. It's just extraordinary to me. And I said to the, the team, just tell him it doesn't work. And they said, you don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, he's yeah. our boss. I mean, literally yeah. our boss in every way. Um, yeah, so I, there, it's, there it goes wrong. But mostly, mostly, you should be able to collaborate with the director in such a way that the director feels really safe with you as a writer, that the director can say, I want more here and less here. And you go, yes, fantastic. Let's do this. We'll find the way together. And that is, is really exciting. I have to say with Ron, he was extremely respectful. I think he had taken on a highly developed script. Yeah. It had been through many processes. His attack was very, uh, it, was, it was a combination. It was very process driven. He really wanted to understand how he was going to film the process and what impact that would have. And a lot of his changes related to that. Um, other changes were he wanted more of a particular element. Like, for example, he wanted more of the uh, the, the guy called the water guy, Tanet, who is up on the mountain um, diverting the water. Um, and uh, he he wanted, let me think, what else was there? We, we did talk quite a lot. We played around quite a lot with changing some of my structure, which, you know, we, we talked, I was willing to... But in the end, we stuck with it. And he will say that the last time we were on a joint Zoom together to talk about this right at this stage, he said that the thing about the screenplay he received was that the structure was there already. 
yeah. and um, you know he he didn't have to really mess with that too much. So, but he's also he's a very nice guy. He's a nice you know? guy. I've worked with him on a couple of projects, and he's he's lovely. He he's just amazing. So I, I just wanted him to be able to do what he needed to do. Yeah. And then the other thing that happened was he started shooting it, and I was not present on the shoot. I was in Australia, yeah. but he was on the phone to me or on the email to me quite a lot saying basically for budget reasons we can no longer do this scene or that scene find a way to write the beat that happens there somewhere else in another way or add it could you please add it in to the existing scene so there was quite a lot of that which I was of course completely willing to do and I think you need to be in that sense a kind of um, craftsman who's mm-hmm. there, you know, we're, we're now sailing the ship and it's leaking. Please, yes. could you plug that gap? Absolutely. Circling back to this, you know, the first time you're talking with a director or really anyone else in the project, um, a friend always reminds me that as a screenwriter, you're the only person who's already seen the movie. Um, so you, you, you've, you've built the whole, you see the whole thing there. And so you have everything that's on the page, but you also have the whole movie in your head. And sometimes those initial conversations are really just aligning what, to, what, what movie it's director seeing in their head and making sure, like, trying to find the overlaps there and, and fix the things that aren't overlapping quite right. And those conversations, it, it varies director to director for me, but it, sometimes you are, you know, spending three days talking about, like, the color of the paint on the walls, but that's really the process for sort of just trying to align your visions for what things really look like and what's important to them and what's important to you. It's, uh, it's never, you never know what it's going to be as you start the process. Yeah, I mean, I don't get into those sorts of conversations. I, I mean, I, I, I'm happy for him to paint the walls whatever color he wants, really. Um, what, what I want to know, well, I say I want to know, I don't have any power in this process. You know, yeah. I can want, but it doesn't get me anywhere. Um, I would like to know that the director sees the same movie as me, but to be honest, I never know until it's done, until it's actually being shot. Because, you know, people do the oddest things. Now, Bill, you've made your you know, living as a playwright and as a um, film writer and director. And do you have any experience running television shows or, or doing any of the sort of the, the series where the writer would be more in control, the writer would be telling the director what to do? Have you had that experience? Uh, not, not in the modern um, form, um, but you're right. It is very, very different in power terms. Back in the day when I was working with BBC, I did... Uh, I think four TV movies. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about the BBC and television then is my name was the name that was in the newspapers to the rage of the directors. Yeah. You know, it was William Nicholson's latest. And I really, of course, liked that. Um, uh, I I, I really dislike the film by thing where directors Mm -hmm. act as if they've created the whole thing. But I've kind of softened over the years. I, I used to be quite militant about this, but I've done two movies myself as a as a um, director writer, and that has taught me to respect good directors very very highly. Yeah. Um, and I, I do realize I need them. Um, I just wish the that the world out there understood what screenwriters do, and I I, I don't know why this hasn't got through. You know, we need a movement like Cahiers du Cinéma, which yeah. elevated the directors, you need a movement. And I, maybe you're right, maybe maybe actually it's happening. It's happening in TV. Yeah. And the, the people who create the great TV series are the writers. So our, our day is, is coming and that's fantastic. And you get astonishing things like Succession, which I, I mean, I don't know who the hero of that is, whether it's Jesse Armstrong um, or, or um, Lucy Preble or, or whoever, I, I don't quite know what's going on, but somebody is doing something completely brilliant there. Yeah. They're also superbly directed, yeah. I have to say. And, and again, you know, let's all try not to quarrel over who gets the credit and be grateful if we can together do something good, because most things kind of don't quite work. Now, circling back to 13 Lives, um, so much of the film is in Thai and a very specific Northern Thai dialect. Um, I'm guessing you don't speak it. So um, at what point in the process did you need to think about how much of the film was going to be in Thai versus how much was going to be in English and what the balance was going to be? Did you have, did you need to interact with any um, you know, Thai experts or you know, 
and those language experts or that come that process come later down later through the process. Uh, it, it came much later um I, I knew all along that a large part would be in Thai that was all part of respect for the people yeah. we were filming and not turning it into a an outsider attack um so, so I write it all in English and you know it goes on the page mm -hmm. in bold italics meaning translate yeah. this please the uh, the team making it under Ron then bring in Thai translators, but not just Thai translators, Thai filmmakers who are also mm. Thai, who tell me about the culture. So back comes the message. You have this scene where this um, uh, Thai Navy SEAL speaks to his boss, his captain, in a quite strong way. They would never do that. That yeah. does not happen. We have total respect for authority people. You've just got to so I say, fine, I change it. So I just simply rewrote. And that happened quite a bit. Um, I, I had a whole lot to do with the um, the governor mm -hmm. um, here who had actually a very interesting story. And I originally made him a kind of rather ironic wry guy who was constantly saying, you know, they, they've set me up for the fall here. Yeah. And there's a little bit of it in the movie, but I had quite a lot more. And I was told he would not speak of his superiors in this way. You, you know, even though he thinks it, even though it's true, mm -hmm. He just wouldn't, so out it went. Well, probably both choices about you know, you know how that character to respond, but also what the movie wants to do. And the movie is so focused on like the question of like, will we be able to get the, the boys out? Anything that feels like it's not to that point is going to be on the chopping block. It's going to be hard for it to to last in the film. You made choices about sort of how much we're seeing or are aware of these characters' personal lives before they get involved. And basically, the moment anybody shows up in Thailand, we're never seeing their homelands again, their home life again. We're basically, we're only going to stay like near the caves here in Thailand. Um, talk to us about sort of decisions to show uh, Colin Farrell's home life and sort of what that's meant, what we were trying to do there. Um, and sort of the, the few glimpses we had outside of Thailand you know, were there more scenes? Like, what were what were your decisions about showing their life before they get to Thailand? No, there were not more scenes. I I knew that I wanted to just tell you enough about them mm -hmm. to give you some anchor for how they were going to take make their emotional journey, and then just show you enough at the end to remind you where they've come from and what it means. They're two different stories, obviously. With with Rick Viggo Mortensen. He lives alone in this kind of chaotic, mm -hmm. machine-filled space. And you kind of sense that the guy's asocial. Yeah. And just from the images of him, mm -hmm. also, there was quite a bit of dialogue there when he's talking on the phone to yeah. John. Um, with, uh, um, with John, with Colin Farrell, all I needed to do was to show that he's divorced and he's got a kid. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he's going to identify the yeah. kids in the cave with his kid. I don't need to say that. Yeah. You just plant that and that's there. Um, I did have in the early um, versions, um, there was another thread. They had a kind of office that the British Cave Rescue Council used. We, and there was a woman there who fed information back all the time. And we did think whether to have her in England, but I really decided, no, this is one of those stories where you need to maintain the pressure cooker get them into the pressure cooker and keep them there. And that was a very conscious decision, which is yeah. why I didn't want to, to go into the home life of any of the Thai characters once the pressure had begun. Um, and I, I mean, I think that it, it's sort of like Aristotelian unities, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a unity of time and place and they're up against the clock and just hold it there. Don't play games. Don't do cutting around um, with uh, um, time. Yeah. give us a sense of the passage of time. Well, I mean, this may speak to your theater background, but it did feel like sort of once you created the, the space of the camp outside the cave, that was your main set. Yeah. That was, that was, that's where your old, everything has to happen within this space yeah. and yeah. Uh, within yeah. this place and time, which I guess helps answer the question of um, your decisions about which of the Thai parents we were going to follow, which ones we were going to identify um, and have some sort of ongoing relationship with. You pick one mother, one father who um, sort of um, we come back to more often we sort of recognize and, which kid is. And a boy. Uh, yeah. And the boy, I mean, I made him up. That didn't happen. Yeah, the, the smallest boy, yeah. But no, 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 no. 
The smallest boy did happen. Um, oh, that's uh, right. The, the boy who the boy one who doesn't go yeah. into the cave and who's out there. I, I wanted one boy who kind of represented the yeah. boys outside. So I that, that didn't actually happen. They, they, they all went into the cave. Um, the, the smallest boy, that was a real thing because I had that in the research. Obviously, um, the mother is a composite mother, the father is a composite mother, etc. Um, I, I wasn't and all their names are changed. Okay. Um, let's talk about structure overall, because um, you have a, a very, you have a time structure, which is, you know, very natural for, for sure, like day one, day two, and sort of seeing the progression. And um, with each day, there's a change that has, has happened. Sometimes it's the weather and the, the way that the weather is a huge villain in the course of the story is, is really interesting. Um, but you also have a the decision to overlay the map and sort of show where things were and how far deep we are into things. Was that a decision that was made on a script level or did that come later on in the filmmaking process? The, the, the literal, like how deep we are um, into the cave system. Structure? That, was, that was not me, that was in the cutting room in the final stages. Yeah. That was Ron and his team doing that in the final stages. Yeah, it's, Looking it's, at it and saying, it is really important that people know how far in we are. In the longer version of the script, mm -hmm. I'd incorporated that information in the, the dialogue and things like that. Yeah. Um, and that didn't survive. Uh, but I thought it was really good. That I thought um, it was a really smart choice. It was really smart. And it was, in a kind of clever way, there was more information than you could take in, but it didn't matter. You kind of got a visual sense. And uh, but no, that was that was not me. Yeah, it, I think it's another thing taken um, probably from some of the great documentaries of the, of the last ten years. Yeah. In that sense yeah. of you know, as you see somebody like climbing um, a peak in Yellowstone or peak, peak in Yosemite, yeah. seeing like how far up they are, and yeah. it was just the right choice to sort of give us that sense. Well, it's of a very interesting challenge. How much does the audience realize? How much have they picked up? How much do they know? What do they need telling? And on the whole, you've got to be ahead of your audience mm -hmm. um, on the whole. But but if they're left saying, you know, we're underwater, I haven't a clue where I am, which of course is the case. How could yeah. they? Yeah. What we did was, and this was in the script, I tried to uh, characterize stages along the journey. So I said, this will be the stalactite one. This will be chamber three. This will be the T-junction. Now, the T-junction was what they called it and Pattaya Beach was what they called it, but um, I, I, I gave a sort of description of each stage so that we could, when they built the sets, they would look a little bit different yeah. and would give us a bit of a sense that we're not just always in a kind of bath. Um, so we did think about that ahead of time. Um, can you talk to us about sort of, you know, you, you said you've written the script, you've, you know, you're heading into production, obviously casting has happened. Was there a table reading? Was there any chance for everyone to sort of get around a table to read this together? It, it doesn't seem like it would be necessary for this, but was there some sort of group? I, I, I simply don't know because it all happened in Australia and I yeah. wasn't there. They all had to fly out and go into quarantine for two weeks and then they were in their bubble. Um, but I would say on, on about this um, table read, which I've had on every film. I absolutely hate them. They always, <laughs> well, there's a couple of reasons. For some reason, the person who reads the directions is the third AD and he can't mm -hmm. read. And so that sounds like a kind of illiterate monotone, which is awful and I'm yeah. dying. And I, I've, I learned after a bit to say, I will let me read yeah. the directions and I'll put some oomph yeah. into it. You know? um, uh, the second reason is the actors find it very, very difficult to know whether they're performing or not. Yeah. And on the whole, they don't want to perform. And they don't want to perform because, you know, why would they? It's a kind of weird set of circumstances. And the, the, the confident ones don't want to perform because, you know, why should I? And the unconfident ones think that they'll perform and be found wanting. People say, why did you cast him? So yeah. the whole thing is awful for everybody. And I've come out of every reading thinking it is a disaster. Um, I mean, I wasn't present at the read through of Gladiator. Mm -hmm. I wasn't on the project, but it was such a disaster that they yeah. practically pulled the whole thing. And that's when I came on board. And um, I mean, I think they're terrible, these, these, these readings. They do have a function because I almost think you should get a whole team of completely different people to do the reading so that the, 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 the tech people, they need to know yeah. a little bit what this thing feels like. The actors, it's hard. So I, I will make a, a mild case for the, the, uh, the opposing view. So 
Um, I've had table reads that have gone as badly as Gladiator's table read, where it's just like, wow. And everything you're saying about sort of a an actor choosing not to perform, if the risk of performing, definitely been there, seen it. My argument for them is like, it makes it clear that all the actors have at least read the whole script once. Um, because, <laughs> because so often actors are, they're reading, they're focused on their part. And so it's yeah. a chance for them to say like, oh, you know what, this scene actually pertains, pertains to the scene before and this scene after. It's it the whole thing feeling together. Mm -hmm. um, chronologically for once because movies are going to be shot out of sequence and it's going to be hard to tell what things are where. So yeah, for one, right. for one moment, everyone was together. The other thing, if anyone's listening and this is helpful, I will tend to do, if, if there is going to be a table reading, I will make a special version of the script that is just for the reading that greatly cuts down the scene description. So it's just getting you right into the dialogue there. And it's, it's all clear that we're not, if we are going to summarize things, everyone's looking at the same page, but I hear that you there. Is that is very smart. I, I think you're quite right. The, the, the table reading should be treated as a kind of performance in its own right and thought mm -hmm. about and almost directed. Yep. Um, and each of the actors could be told, don't worry about it. You know, just do it clearly. That's all. You don't need to emote if you don't want to. Yeah. Um, I have been at readings. I mean, when um, uh, uh, Shadowlands was, was mm -hmm. done as, as a reading, um, you know, it was amazingly successful and it made everybody feel this is going to work. You know? Yeah. Um, I just wish that happened every time. Yeah, my movie Go had a great table reading and some of the other ones haven't. And of course, in theater, the idea of a reading is actually super common and that those are ways you sort of get financing, and you get to the next level. And so everyone understands that is a sort of a form of a performance there. But uh, with movies, it's a special thing. And it, it really... You have to ask yourself who should be in the room for that. Is it yeah. just for the filmmakers and the actors? Or are you trying to do producers need to be in there? Do financiers need to be in there? It's well, I, I really like your idea of of having a, a special text mm -hmm. for the reading because that's great. Because you just want you want to maintain the pace. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've sat there while somebody reads through a whole page of directions in Brutal. a kind of flat tone, kind of just well, it needs to be tightened performed and move on you know yeah. so that we can get the feeling feeling of it i hadn't thought of that <laughs> if it ever happens to me again it's quite a lot of work though isn't it doing your yeah, i mean script. but i mean for you or for me it's it's maybe it's two hours of time to take yeah, the script yeah. and sort yeah, of yeah. cut it down and yeah, maybe yeah. if it saves a lot of drama down the road I'll, I'll, I'll do it and do you do you read the directions yourself no we'll we'll find somebody who's actually a talented actor who's not yeah. in the production to do it good and so my good. friend dan etheridge is fantastic at that so i'll, I'll draft yeah. him whenever possible yeah you, you've thought about this much more yeah. than me. This is smart <laughs> now let's during the production obviously this is happening in australia and you know at most you're having a phone call or a zoom with ron so you're not super involved in that at yeah. any point during post do you, do you come back in do you take a look or was yes. there anything for you yes. to do yeah well i mean this is entirely at ron's discretion yeah um but you know he's a nice guy and he's also a smart guy and when he was it was cut in london so he right. said would i please come in see the first assembly talk to him about it we talked together then i came in and saw the um the the, the shorter version and and we talked about that a lot so I, I wouldn't say that i did anything tremendously significant but i was certainly there watching it right and talking about it with him and i was incredibly grateful for that a lot of directors are frightened of writers mm -hmm. because they know the writer knows more than them what's supposed to be there. Yeah. And they don't want the writer on set and they don't want the writer in the cutting room um, and they don't want the writer getting too much credit. <laughs> but Ron is not like that. That's that's terrific. Um, can you talk to us about sort of, so this movie came out um, theatrically limited, but then also on streaming. Did you have a chance to see this with an audience? um well not really um it, it as you know mgm who financed it got bought by amazon yeah. after we finished the movie so it kind of didn't get the the screen life that mm -hmm. we would have liked yeah i mean you know i'm old-fashioned i like cinemas i like theaters yeah. um but they did put on a kind of not exactly a, this was in london there's a premiere in la but which i didn't go to i was obviously invited but i i chose not to, yeah. to make the journey. Uh, but there was a good screening in London. And I, we were in um, uh, France and we got the train back for that evening and the train was delayed three hours in the Channel Tunnel to my fury. So I actually missed about half. 
oh, no. and we got got into the theatre. So, so I I haven't seen it much with an audience, and now it's seen as a streaming um, event, and people see it sort of separately. So I, I've got this odd feeling. I don't really know how people have responded to it. My my instinct, so I watched it again. I watched it last night at home, streaming it. Um, my instinct, though, is that there's going to be some big cheers when the first kid is like um, brought on the stretcher up through the pulley system. Like that was a really emotional moment for me. Um, is that seeing that the, the kids are going to get out, but also that everyone is there pushing the sled out together. I feel like that's mm -hmm. the moment where you're going to get some mm -hmm. cheers in the audience. Um, and so I'm I'm frustrated that you didn't get a chance to hear those cheers because yeah. I feel like it's yeah. going to be a uh, it's going to be a great sound. Well, Bill, an absolute pleasure talking with you and meeting you here. Uh, this is you know congratulations on the film. I'm really excited to see these next projects as well. Um, a delight. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure for me as well talking to somebody who gets these things. <laughs> a fellow, I love it. All right. Thank Thanks you. very much. Bye. Have a great night. Bye. Bye. -bye.